So, with that, does anyone have any questions for me? They can be anything. Like, we could talk about a topic that I didn't talk about. You could ask a question about a clarification of something that we did talk about. You could ask me how I got here, uh, what I ate for breakfast, anything. Yeah. So, Chris and I were talking about, so during when we've had ice ages and then we've had a series of the warming of the cl climate, because um, how has that affected sea life, or did it happen so gradually um, in eons back? Yeah. Did it happen so gradually that it didn't affect the animals as much, or did we lose and gain animals during those times? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's an excellent topic. Ice was actually one of the topics that uh, I had prepared for this talk, but realized I didn't have enough time to talk about eight topics. Um, so yeah, the way that uh, ice ages have impacted animal populations throughout Earth's history, there have been, uh, actually there have been six major ice ages. There have been much smaller ones, uh, numerous smaller ice ages, but six major ice ages. And you can actually see three of them happened before life evolved on Earth, but that's okay. Um, and uh, a couple of them actually can be linked with evolutionary jumps in certain species of animals. One of the biggest ice ages on Earth happened right before the Precambrian explosion. So Earth at a certain time was had more ice on it than uh, free ice than ice free zones. Uh, it looked more like a snowball. Uh, and so yeah, that definitely impacted the species that could survive in those environments. But yes, they happened very, very gradually, even over millions of years. And so populations either moved, because uh, during ice ages, the polar regions tend to expand and other regions tend to contract towards the equator. So a reef population that's closer to the pole, in Australia for instance, might migrate over a number of millions of years north. And then as the water warms, it naturally falls into the areas where it's most habitable. So populations will migrate over large periods of time. Certain populations will be wiped out by things uh, like ice ages. Yeah. Corals are particularly tem uh, temperamental with temperature changes. Yeah. Yes, um, um, since we're using water as a resource from the ocean, I'm just wondering how that's affecting um, Can you elaborate what you mean by well, using so water? Like down in California, mm. you know, just so often there's too many yeah. stations that they're using because we droughts and yeah. whatnot, even though I know this last year we've had more rain. Mm. And so, but I'm just curious what's yeah. impacting. So, if we're talking about uh, using the water in the ocean for things like irrigation uh, or uh, even drinking water, using the water as a direct resource isn't very common. It takes a lot of energy to desalinate that. So uh, developed countries like the US are the only uh, population currently doing that. And of course, I, I will not say that there's so much water in the ocean that we can't make a dent. That's the same type of thinking that people went into like whaling with. Oh, it's the ocean. It's so big, we can't possibly change anything. Now, 100, 200 years later, there aren't any whales. Um, so. It, it, it does and will have an impact. For now, at least, the amount of usage doesn't uh, or couldn't affect something on the scale of the ocean. Keep in mind that uh, 90, something like 90%, nine, over 90% of the water on Earth is salt water. In the remaining couple percent points uh, of water that's either locked up in ice or locked up in groundwater, a tiny fraction of a fraction of a percent of water on Earth is drinkable or usable for well, irrigation. Actually, I think so, as as much as you might look into harvesting water for something like irrigation, you could you could get as much water again from the ocean as is used in all. You could double the amount of fresh water uh, on Earth by taking it from the ocean, and that wouldn't dent the ocean at all. Uh, so if it works, if it's efficient, I'd say that's, a prop that's probably a pretty good uh, source of fresh and drinkable water. But I hesitate to say that because I don't know all of the factors involved. It's a good question. Yes? I really like the way you 
like just a comment. I really like how there was no beginning and end in the way you presented things, mm. but you could jump from one to the next in any sequence. And I'm wondering if, I don't know, if, even if you would be interested in somehow bringing this to an audience of like middle school oh, kids, especially yes. the last interactive part, instead of them sitting there listening to somebody go through slides, mm. just participate. Mm. So, and I don't know, you could tailor it to younger audiences, yeah. but uh, I was thinking middle school or high school would be a target. So, just a thought. Yeah, absolutely. It would be very effective. I, I think so too. One of the primary, the, the target audience for this presentation was a little bit higher of an age range, uh, but a little late, a little end it came. Um, and yet, one of the main ideas that I went into the senior thesis with was what are the ways that we can build bridges and connect with various people of age ranges. I played with puppets on stage. That's something uh, that middle school or even younger students. Yes, exactly. Can appreciate. Um, at this level, I hope that there was something that you know a PhD student could get out of this talk in the same way that a, a fourth grader might. Um, but definitely talking about the way that science education is so crucial for kids, I think a style like this is really effective. Um, and. I mean, fun for me as well, as a presenter. So I've already been asked with this presentation style to, t to give talks uh, at the UW, and uh, I'm definitely looking into ways uh, to expand that into younger audiences. I love working with kids. Pacific Science Center somehow? That be Anyone have any connections? <laughs> Don't have a job right now. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, I mean to take this format and continue to diversify and fill gaps in scientific education. Thank you. Question. So uh, you've had a series of droughts on the West Coast, and this year was a breakout year. Um, have there been any projections with the trends? I mean, it's great to have all this extra precipitation on the West Coast, but I mean, in terms of where the jet stream is going and how weather patterns are going to be changing, is there any sense of where? So to add a little bit of context to the drought that we just had, uh, that was related to something called El Nino, which is a slackening of the wind that pushes all of the hot temperatures off into the uh, western Pacific. If those slacken, then temperatures, then currents change, temperatures change, everything changes, and that uh, in general decreases the amount of precipitation. So that's what happened over the last couple of years. And as of yet, scientists have no idea what causes El Ninos, or La Ninos, which is the opposite. Um, they tend to go in up and down cycles. So in terms of, uh, I, I can give you a general future progress projection of, we'll probably have a La Nina soon. Um, but more than that, I can't tell you why. <laughs> and I can't tell you how severe. Uh, climate scientists are working on that right now. Uh, what I can tell you is that generally things are changing in a progressive direction and El Ninos might be getting worse and La Nina is getting weaker. Whatever the trend is, things are changing in a generally uh, negative, for, negative for life way. And I only say that because it's moving away from a stasis. It'll find some other stasis and things will get used to that, maybe, if it doesn't keep changing. Uh, but I don't know enough personally about the, the trends on the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but El Nino and La Nina are involved, and the general trends are also uh, related and will continue unless things start to change in a real global sense. Yeah? What are some of the things that didn't make it into the, just like, what did you look at and you just were like, oh, I wish I could have talked about this, but... Yeah. Uh, ice, I had a whole topic on ice, uh, extraterrestrial ocean, I've already mentioned some of them, extraterrestrial oceans, so cool. Um, looking at naval history, the history of the way that humans have used the ocean to wage war uh, is an entire topic that's really, really cool. Human um, migrations are another topic that I really wanted to talk about. I wanted to do a whole section on coral reefs uh, because I have, I have I spent seven years on Guam diving and snorkeling and uh, surfing, so I love coral reefs. 
Um, there are plenty of other topics. I could do an entire, uh, entire topic on uh, river deltas or estuary systems and the way that fresh and salt water interact. Uh, there's so much to talk about. Um, and I, I plan on having, adding, eventually adding more and more topics and, you know, maybe these topics become like uh, limited resources. We'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a talk, but we can only get to 60% of the topics in an hour, so who knows? It's, it's meant to be a dynamic system. Cool, thank you very much.